the East Regional Vice President with uh, the Tennessee Chapter HFMA. I appreciate your attendance today uh, for the session, The Clearinghouse and the ICD-10 by Tom Wohler. Uh, and so let me mention a couple of other uh, upcoming events that we have. The Region 5 webinar is tomorrow, October the 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, you can go to the HFMA Region 5 Dot org. Uh, that's HFMA region, the number five, dot org for more information. Um, the session tomorrow is regarding uh, tax law. Uh, the 2013 uh, Tennessee Fall Institute is October the 23rd through the 25th in Gatlinburg. Uh, if you've not made your plans to attend, we have a, an outstanding uh, session planned uh, event for three days. So. Uh, go to uh, the website uh, thefallinstitute.org and it has all of the details um, available for um, that meeting. Um, today's session, um, as I mentioned, our speaker is um, Tom Waller. He's with MDON and he's been uh, with the MDON, a related company, since 1996. His role is to bridge the gap between the providers and MDON. Tom helps providers maximize their investment in MDON technology and helps MDON better understand their clients' needs. Tom has spoken on various revenue cycle topics at a number of HFMA groups and at him. And with that, I'm going to turn it to Tom. And if you've got questions during the event, just pop them in your chat box and we'll get to them either at the end of the session or if we have a break um, in topics during that time. So, Tom? Thank you very much, Martha. Hello, Tennessee. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak with you today. It's a pleasure for me, and I hope it's going to be a pleasure for you also. The only one I hope is disappointed is my puppy, who had to be locked up in the back room while we do the webinar. <clears throat> there are so many points of ICD-10 impact, and clearinghouses often perform a number of functions for providers that I think it's important that we talk about the scope of today's talk. In addition to the base function of a clearinghouse, that of accepting inbound claims and distributing them to appropriate payers, clearinghouses like ours often provide other services, such as advanced editing, claim workflow, underpayment recognition and recovery, denial workflows and recovery services, and payment posting. My remarks today will be focused on the base clearinghouse EDI claim transactions, our provider readiness for the claiming transaction, and a number of things that we think you should consider that will aid you in your preparation and testing. And hopefully we'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of payer readiness and what we've seen in provider testing in the early um, days. In the Clearinghouse Claims EDI environment, ICD-10 impact centers around facilitating the testing for payers and providers, payer readiness and their timing, ensuring compliant claim content, our editing, and ensuring that what we uh, that we are doing what we can to facilitate health e-commerce as we transition to ICD-10 and ICD-10 PCS. We are working very hard to ensure that we truly are your pathway to success. The good news is that the claim pathways that are being transacted today using 837 version 5010 format, this transaction transition is relatively straightforward. It amounts to little more than changes to the underlying edit rules, and we make those kind of changes all the time. For providers exchanging 837-5010, the massive effort necessary to implement ICD-10 all fall 
free claim. And the majority of concern regarding ICD-10, regarding claiming transactions, is about whether or not your reimbursement is going to be impacted. At this point, let's take a quick poll and see how you guys are feeling about the impact of ICD-10. Martha, can you put up the poll? Martha, has the poll come up? Hey, John, this is Brad. Yeah, the poll is uh, is showing. Um, let me see what our responses are like. All right, we, we have got uh, pretty good responses in here. 71% um, of our audience has voted and the majority, 82% of them, um, have selected um, that they think ICD-10 will be no different than 5010. Um, there'll be some confusion and delayed revenue. Oh, excellent. I'm glad we didn't pick number one because that, that certainly is not the case. And I think it would be um, totally inappropriate for us to pick number three that the business is going to be uh, terminated because of ICD-10. Although I do think a vacation is probably a good idea shortly after we get through the muck. Maybe first part of 2015 would be a good idea. Over the past few years, U.S. healthcare has undergone uh, quite a few changes. You may have noticed a few of them. Most of them have been focused on provider and EDI standardization. For healthcare as a whole, ICD-10 impacts more departments and has more potential to be more disruptive to the organization and your cash flow than anything we've done before. It's likely we'll be requiring action by not only the physician, the coding department, the billing department, your claim software systems, the clearinghouse, and the payer, but also a number of other internal systems that use the information that's now going to be coded in a totally new way. We simply have not had a change of this magnitude during the healthcare EDI era. My memory serves me correctly. The last time um, we changed to, uh, well, when we changed to ICD-9, that was 30 years ago. And not very many of you were submitting EDI at the time. In the earlier changes, your clearinghouse could help providers and payers bridge the gap as systems were remediated because many of them were remediated at different times. We could crosswalk your legacy provider IDs into NPIs. We could take older format claims and convert them into useful new ones. For ICD-10, this is not going to be possible. For the vast majority of healthcare, Converting ICD-9 to ICD-10 is a non-starter. Stepping ICD-10 claims down to ICD-9, a bit more possible, but for most all providers, we'll still leave a lot of claims on the sidelines. And if these things are done without your complete understanding of the process, you may open up yourself to compliance issues.
Let's take another pause and see how ready for ICD-10 you feel you are. Okay, the next polling question has been launched. I will have um, I will have coded ICD D10 claims for my core system ready for EDI submission. Select one, they're ready now. You're ready before the end of the year. You're ready by first quarter 2014. You're ready by second quarter 2014. Are you ready by third quarter 2014? Uh, we'll leave it open for just a few minutes. Um, we've got about half of everybody that's voted. And it looks like um, with about mo the majority voted that about um, about half says they'll be ready by first quarter 2014. Um, another 20% is going to be ready uh, by the end of this year, and 7% are ready now. Oh, excellent. And that pretty much mirrors what we're seeing in the national surveys that are being done, that during first quarter we'll get a lot of activity where we'll have claims that were actually coded for ICD-10 available for test. And that's great. And anyone who's ready now, I'm going to encourage you to listen in and see if you can't get those claims in full test mode so we can flesh some things out. <clears throat> we think that the pathway to success begins with self-knowledge. Your pre-claim efforts will culminate with a claim that is sent somewhere in some format. For most of customers, there's a mix of formats, as some payers may require printed output for some specialized claims and EDI for others. I think I've got a slide out of sequence here. Hold on. Martha, I think I'm having a little technical difficulty here. Okay. Um, can you guys take back control and control the slides? I can. Pull up the slides. And I think all I have is PDF. I don't have the slides in anything but PDF. So will that work? Sure. We'll go from there. Okay. So there we go. Let's um, go back two slides. Go backwards a few. One more. One. All right. Super. Let's start right here. Let's know our... EDI format at this point. 
if you're exchanging ANSI version 5010, A37-5010, that's the preferred and really the only um, EDI interface point. It is possible that you can use UB04 data. It carries enough data, but doesn't have quite all of the information that the ANSI transaction can um, carry. There's a new revised CMS 1500 form for our professional side submitters that can carry the data. That form becomes effective January of 2014 for regular use. And if you're using a UB92 of version 4010, the original CMS 1500, or the HICFA 1500, we've got to move you off of those formats in order to support ICD-10. So if all of your output files are version 5010, give yourself a gold star. Breathe just a little bit easier. If not, there's real work to be done. Depending on how your claim process works, you may need to migrate those core systems into an ANSI 837-5010 format. And I think it's important that if you're on one of the older formats that you reach out to your vendors and ensure that they are moving you to an environment that's going to allow you to get on the pathway for success. Let's go to the next slide. Down one more. In the past, you may have heard your manager, your director, your CFO, they might have mentioned how important cash is to the organization. Hopefully a few of you are chuckling to yourselves at this point. With many providers, just a few percentage points of cash move them into the danger zone. Even delays in the cash flow, uh, receipt of cash can be very difficult for providers. We think it's prudent that healthcare understand the number of moving parts involved in ICD-10 and recognize that there is at least short-term risk to cash flow, much like we experienced in the transition to 5010. Let me suggest that your pathway to success begins with knowing your payers and your reimbursement structure. What about your contracts? Many of our providers are reporting that they have commercial and Medicaid contracts that, that tie reimbursement to specific diagnosis codes or are DRG based. Let me suggest that you identify those specific codes and situations and even procedure codes and get in discussions with new contract terms with those payers that incorporate both old and new. Waiting is simply going to make it very difficult to manage some of these things. On the institutional side, concern about DRG shift is one of the most uh, talked about subjects. Knowing what those payers are going to do with the diagnosis portion, the D in DRG, and how those changes are going to impact your organization is critical. We think this is going to be a topic that's going to be uh, continue on through early 2012. Don't let yourselves uh, fall to sleep thinking that everything is going to be okay with the DRG related reimbursement. Remember there's also still some payers that are paper only 
or require paper for some claims, as we talked about before. On the institutional side, UB04 for these payers should work just fine. On the professional side, both be sure that both you and the payer are moving to the new revised CMS 1500 form. That form has the fields necessary to do business after October of next year. In fact, you can start using it beginning in January. No other paper forms besides the revised CMS 1500 and the UB04 can support the data appropriately to get to ICD-10. Next slide. To continue our pathway to success, I strongly encourage your organization to open dialogues with the payers that you've identified are key to you. And here are a few things that we, you should have a conversation about. It's sad to say, but some payers do not exchange 837-5010 with clearinghouses today. They're on version 4010 or even some earlier formats. Just as it's required that your input be ICD-10 capable, version 5010, theirs must also. On our side, our teams have a laser focus on these payers, and we'll be doing all that we can to transition them in time but we think it's important that you as the providers know what those payers are doing and how soon they'll be doing it. When you talk with your payers, what are they saying about their plans for compliance? Are they ready now? Will they be ready on time? Try to go beyond what's just on the website. That information may have been put there by the legal department and not operations. Don't assume just because they're ready that they're willing to test. Medicare and several other major national payers are not planning to test with all providers. Still others have plans to test with a very, very limited number of providers. And in general, these have been pre-selected and outreach to those providers is already ongoing. Ask your payers about testing. Can you test now? If not, how soon? If they're willing to test with you, what is it that you can test? Is it just EDI? Or can you test all the way through to reimbursement? And if they test, what data is required and how will be returned? And we'll look at this in a little bit more depth a little bit later on. If the payer is unwilling to test, but they exchange 5010 with the clearinghouse today, don't panic. It's very likely that your EDI flow will move as expected. It's just that you won't have a direct view into any reimbursement activity that may change. Next slide. I think we're ahead of ourselves. Okay. Uh, go back a couple slides. Okay, next one down. That was the one we just finished up with, so that should be the next one. Okay, great. Um, with that payer inventory, 
let's make sure that we know the pathways your claim takes. You may know that in some cases clearinghouses exchange data between themselves before it reaches the finer pay, final payer. Is your pathway to that those payers that are important to you a single clearinghouse or is there a handoff or two? If there are multiple handoffs, you need assurance that each partner has successfully tested their connectivity and ensure that East, uh, ICD-10 EDI will flow. And of course, reimbursement testing is still going to be between the payer and the provider. Remember to explore secondary claim pathways. Many of us have become very accustomed to having highly functional electronic delivery of many of our secondary claims. Some of those claims come from crossover claims from Medicare. You'll need to be wary that Medicare will be ready on time, but a trading partner won't be. How will those claims be managed? And also, many of those secondary claims are going to reach payers on paper. Make sure that everyone's ready to accept the new CMS 1500 form on the professional side. That's appropriate. We also think that these crossover claims are going to be problematic. I think it's just very likely to be the case that at least some that have crossed over well in the past may fail. So we think it's prudent that you be prepared to manage more secondary claims in a hands-on way than you have in the past. And in some cases you may need to code the secondary claim back at ICD-9 level in order to get paid. We think there'll be a lot of moving parts as it relates to secondary claims. So that brings up the point for me about how flexible will your HIS or practice management system be in creating output coded to match the payer's requirements. Is it going to support dual coding? Are you going to code in 10? and have some kind of a down conversion to nine available on demand? And how quickly will you be able to react to changing landscape? Let's take another quick break and survey you on your readiness. Next slide. Now that you've, um, you know where you are with your EDI, you've inventoried your claim pathways, and you've identified potential problems, let's talk a bit about what we're seeing at the clearinghouse. For payers exchanging 837-5010, as I said before, this is a pretty straightforward process. There are no changes mandated to the claim acknowledgement, the claim status transactions, and no changes are anticipated by the payers. This is good news for those of you who went through the conversion to 5010 with us when some payers changed the way they reported claim rejections using the 999 to report rejected claims. That came as a bit of a surprise to much of the industry. And there's also no change to the remittance format, the 835. So we are very confident in our ability to move ICD-10, 5010 data. Many of our vendor partners have already been very successful in testing with us. 
and there haven't been any aha moments. In our case, uh, no aha is good. As of today, testing is hampered by lack of provider data coded natively for ICD-10. And we think, as you said in the survey, that by the first quarter of 2014, we're going to see quite a few more providers who've reached this milestone. At the Clearinghouse, we've had resources allocated to help providers and to help payers who are not yet trading at this level. But we are just about a year away. And it really does feel like that to us. This engine is going to start to get an awful lot more steam come January, February, and March. And we're really hoping that we'll have solid EDI from providers moving to payers so that you can flesh out not only the EDI portion, often called claim testing, and ensure revenue neutrality. Next slide. We think it's very important that providers test natively coded ICD-10 claims with their clearinghouse. We're so supportive of this testing that we've been testing hands-on with providers for most of 2013. And our self-service testing portals for providers and for payers has been open since July. Testing your output should expose any issues regarding the format of your file or how you're using the loops and segments. It should help you ensure that you're sending appropriate workable codes. And it should uncover, in many cases, issues with activities at the coding level. We think you'll find that this testing is both informative and useful. In our payer testing, uh, provider testing environment, as you submit claims to test your EDI, those claims that are valid are immediately available to payers for their testing. They'll use those claim files to ensure that their EDI systems are working as expected. And many of them are then checking to make sure that their reimbursement is working as expected. But it's critical that we get the test database populated for your claims. At the clearinghouse today, um, we don't see anywhere near enough provider-side testing. So if you have claims available and you're moving those claims directly to MDON, please check out the workflow processes to support your testing. Next slide. We think that it's critical that you know what your clearinghouse is planning to do. Is there an FAQ available from them? Do their answers instill confidence, helping you understand that they understand the complexities of healthcare in real life? Are they promising things that they can't do? And here are a few key points we think that you should know from our side. For our clearinghouse, we're ready to test now. There's no cost to providers, no cost to payers for using the self-service testing exchange. There's no limit and no time, no time frame for testing. 
no quantity of claims that you can test. We'll be returning our normal clearinghouse file level acceptance reports. And the claims that you submit that pass our edits will be available for payers to finalize testing with you. Now when we're in production, you'll be able to submit both ICD-9 and ICD-10 coded claims to payers as you see fit. Unless we are strictly uh, specifically instructed by a payer to do so, all the claims, regardless of the coding format and regardless of the dates of the claim, will be sent on to payers. And we'll let the payer decide the suitability for payment. As many of you may, may recall, one of the challenges we faced with the conversion to 5010 was being able to deliver formats, uh, claims in a format that the payer could adjudicate with at that moment. Some payers published that they needed 5010, but when we sent claims, they found that they were unable to effectively adjudicate them. So they reverted back to 4010. The communication pathways were unable to keep up with the amount of changes happening. And in some cases, things changed several times during the day. At MDON, our stake in this is to ensure EDI for healthcare. And so we're not going to block content just because the dates of the claim and the coding will pass what we get and allow that payer to decide whether they can accept it or not. With ICD-10, it's not possible for the clearinghouse to effectively translate from 9 to 10. Even translating 10 down to 9 cannot be done 100% effectively. Our plan will allow providers to determine for themselves what coding method is appropriate moment to moment. We believe that this is the most effective way to facilitate healthcare electronic commerce. In our work with payers, we're asking them if they could, if they're going to reject claims, that they reject those claims at the front door, not during adjudication. And the other thing that we're asking them to do is when they reject those claims, that they provide a human readable message that clearly tells the provider what they need to do to submit a payable claim. Let's take one more pause, flip to this next slide, and take a survey about how you feel about payer testing. Okay, the, the survey question should be up. I'm confident that my payers will test with me. Strongly agree, moderately agree, disagree, strongly disagree. About half or about the majority voted the um, results. Um, should be 77% moderately agree, 8% um, or 15% disagree, 8% strongly agree. Interesting. I hope you guys are right. We're a little bit concerned about what we see in terms of payer willingness to test with large numbers of providers. But through your encouragement, the encouragement of the HFMA, and the other industry groups, 
we're hoping that you will be able to transact payer testing and systems like MDON self-service environment will serve you well. Let's go to the next slide. Then why do you want to test with payers? Although many payers are saying they're unable or unwilling to test with all providers, we think it's important that providers test with all the payers that are willing. We think that payer testing has the potential to expose issues with code usage and systematic issues that will impact claims for all of your payers. Given that ICD-10 changes the very base language we use to record the patient's condition, the testing plan needs to be very different than the one that we use for version 5010. 5010 testing could be very limited as the changes were just to the EDI format and not much about claim content. Small samples could prove that your claims would meet expectations. That's simply not true for ICD-10. We think you should try to test high volumes of claims exploring many scenarios. And we think you should plan to test multiple times as you will learn more and more about the payer responses through each iteration. You should be pressing for testing all the way to reimbursement wherever it's possible. And you need to be ready to evaluate both the reimbursement as well as the denial data. Both have an impact on your ability to process those claims, the payment, and work the denials. Next slide. We think that there's a great benefit to the payer to have you test. In our early testing with providers who could natively code claims, I think some payers were surprised by the wide variations of ICD-10 codes that were being used. Testing with your payers will help expose those and help them understand you better as you flesh out what your coders are going to do. Much of the early testing was designed to be direct correlation testing of claims originally coded and adjudicated as ICD-9. And in early testing, it was very clear that there were unexpected variations in how claims were coded by providers. Now, much of that is changing as folks are getting better at the coding piece and as payers are better at understanding the actions. We hope that you're right about your readiness during first quarter, that many of your, you will be able to supply at least small volumes of natively coded ICD-10 claims that were worked from the original patient record. It's those claims that will have the most real life experience that is directly related to what claims will look like come October 1st of next year. We strongly encourage you to be ready to test and take every opportunity to test. Next slide. Now I hope I've convinced you to test with payers and by the survey it sounds like you guys think that you're likely to be able to test with payers. 
and I hope I've convinced you that the right place to start is natively coded ICD-10 from the original patient information. Taking an 837 file and changing out the diagnosis codes is nice and will help you understand how the EDI functions, but the real benefit is in knowing what the coders are going to do and what they see on the medical record. Let's take a look at some of the impediments to testing that you're likely to encounter. I don't want to be a naysayer, but I do want to put these things out. I said it before, but it, it does bear repeating. Not all payers will be willing to test with you. Medicare being the number one. When you can test, you may find that the payer has limitations to the scope of their testing environment. Given the complexity of their environments and all the different data that's necessary to validate a claim, I think you can understand. There may be a limitation to the uh, patients that you can use. In the very early testing, patients weren't eligible for coverage and gave us all a little bit of a chuckle because obviously they weren't, weren't going to be eligible in the future. There may be restrictions on the dates of service that you can use or the types of services that can be tested. For example, on these test claims, will you be reporting future dates or current dates? You may find that you're being limited to a simple set of historic claims chosen for you. Regardless of what the impediments are, we really suggest that you do your best to accommodate those needs and test with those payers. We think the benefits can be significant. Be sure that you and the payer are as clear as you can be about how far the testing will go. Will it be just the EDI exchange to ensure that the claim makes it all the way through the clearinghouse and is read properly by the payer? Or will you be able to test reimbursement and potentially denial data? Will you able, be able to see actual denial codes? Or will they be stand-in codes? How confident will you be that the codes uh, translate appropriately? We don't expect that there will be the ability to supply payer reporting all the way back through clearinghouse processes. Those test systems just don't exist in um, most people's world to be able to flow that data back and forth. Moving the claims from you to the payer should work. Moving um, response data back is probably best handled directly from the payer to you. And since there's no requirements for changing the format of those response files to us, Everything should work as expected when we move into production environments. And lastly, will you need any special tools to read that response data from the payer? In a few cases, there have, to, there have been needed to have special viewers built or um, little gyrations to be able to understand what the data is showing you. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, we've been testing with payers and providers pretty much all of this year. I'll point out just a few of the most noteworthy things that we've seen in hopes that you can avoid them with your early testing. The good news is that these are generally easy to correct. A single claim can only have either 
ICD-9 or ICD-10. It should go without saying that that's the case, but I'd say a significant percentage of the claims we receive fail because there's mixed coding on them. They can't be mixed on the claim, but it is completely valid for you to send both coding formats in the same file, just not the same claim. Don't forget to indicate at the claim level the coding method. Since for many of you this may be defaulted or blank, it's a common mistake. And in addition to changes to the diagnosis codes that as we move to ICD-10, we also move to ICD-10 PCS at the same time. When billing your ICD-10 inpatient claims, be sure that you use ICD-10 procedure codes also. All in all, EDI testing with providers, submitting 837-5010 has gone very well. Once you get to the point where you can create those claims, this piece of the testing should be pretty straightforward. Next slide. So what have we seen in testing with payers? This EDI testing has also gone very well. It is a very easy transition in the EDI portion. On the payment side, there have been early issues with some payers. They're either crosswalking codes or tables weren't loaded appropriately or some of them, in some cases, they just simply hadn't planned for the way ICD-10 codes would be used. There have been a few reimbursement calculations which have gone awry. Most of those problems were early in 2013, and we don't see much of them today. We think that as you get test files in 2014, your testing will go much smoother than the very early adopters did. And we'll be very excited for you guys to share your results with us for those payers that will test. We'll be monitoring provider and payer activity, and we'll be reporting on significant events starting in early 2014 as we have more and more data to report on. Right now I have payers who want to test but don't have natively coded ICD-10 claims available to them. So we're very interested at MDON to have you guys fill the pipeline so that payers will be able to bring those files down and begin the testing process with you. Let's press for a successful implementation of ICD-10. We as an industry need this and we need it to go off as well as possible. I hope the time we shared today was valuable to you, and I'm happy to entertain some questions. I think the appropriate format is to type them into the question box, and we'll deal with them from there. Yes, if you have a question, just type that into your uh, the chat area, and we will uh, try to answer those. I'll try to feed those to, to uh, Tom so that he can uh, answer those. Tom, at this time we do, do not have any questions. Um, I will give everybody a, a few more minutes, but uh, I would like to thank you for for sharing your information um, with us on the ICD-10. I know that's 
that's a hot topic on everybody's mind, and uh, we are now under a year to get there, and uh, it will be interesting to to see if everybody's ready. Um, I hope everybody's ready by the uh, end of first quarter. Uh, so it's going to be a good time to be in healthcare. Plenty of moving parts. Um, I still don't see any questions, so we must not have any. Um, I will um, indicate that uh, uh, if you didn't get the slides, the slides are available for download at the Tennessee, uh, the TNHFMA.org website. Again, a reminder of the Fall Institute uh, and all of the information uh, for the Fall Institute that's in a couple weeks is at uh, thefallinstitute.org. I do have one question. Let's see. Great information. Thanks for providing uh, the webinar. So I think that's uh, information. And there will be a recording available um, on our website uh, later. It will probably take it a week to get up on, on that information. Well, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, there's available recordings of past webinars that we've held uh, as well. Just go to the, the tnhfma.org website and you can find those. And you should be able, to, those attendees should be able to, when I close the session, we'll be able to um, have a, a survey that should populate. And if you can respond to your survey, then that will help us direct uh, other uh, topics for our webinars. So with that, um, and I see no more questions, I will um, say we're finished. And Tom, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day.